how do we grow a different object from another object? From a teapot, to a head, to a hand, to a monkey. For that, we need SDFs and some basic logic. We first need, of course, an object. Or actually, we need two objects because, you know, we want to morph two objects together. So we already have the default cube and let's add a monkey. And now the question is, how can we smooth them together? so that they have this, you know, kind of weld between them. For that, uh, we can use uh, the logic of metaballs. So if you take uh, from here a metaball, for example, remove this here, and you take another one, then you see they smooth together. They have this like a blend behavior, and that's because they use SDF. So for example, if you would uh, to convert the monkey into the meta monkey, and the cube into meta cube, we would probably get the same results, and that's what we're going to do. Now, this is not automatic in Blender. We cannot just, you know, convert those from this menu here like that. We have to do this with Java Tree Nodes. So what are metaballs exactly? How can we replicate this behavior? Well, for that, we need to understand what is an SDF. So an SDF is a signed distance field, and it tells you per an element, for example, in this case, the pixel on the screen, tells you the length to the nearest surface of the desired field or an object. Like, for example, when you have here the SDF of the circle group, Let's make circle with a radius of 10. This means we will subtract 10 from the formula and we get this. So now for each pixel, you can see the distance to the surface of the circle. Now the inside gets a negative values and the outside is positive. If you take absolute value, you can see it, you know, looks actually like that. So now let's say we have two spheres. So how do we combine them on the screen? We can do that with the min operation, for example. So for every pixel on the screen or every whatever element you're calculating this field on, we will select the smallest value possible. This means either from the blue circle or from the red circle. So this means the two SDFs will now share the ground very well, because for example here, the blue circle has very large values as it's very far from the surface, but the red circle has small values as they are close to the surface. So the red circle dominates here, and the opposite is happening here, where the blue one has the high ground. So if you want to smooth them now out, like metaballs do, you can use the smooth minimum operation instead of the normal min, which gets rid of the hard cut here. So if you want to smooth a monkey and, for example, a cube, then we need the SDF of the monkey and of the cube. And it's very, very easy. Let's build a primitive SDF uh, generator for us. So for that, let's add a geometry nodes window here. And let's add a morphing object, like just a plane, for example. And I'm going to call this one a morph. And let's add a new set of geometry nodes called morph. And uh, maybe let's make also the monkey a little bit smaller because it's a bit of a huge, huge monkey here right now. So as you know, the SDF is about the distance per each element. So for that, what we can do is turn in the Susan and also use the node called proximity, which gives us the proximity for each element of this plane, it calculates the closest uh, face on the monkey, closest face, as you see, and then gives us the distance. So let's uh, visualize this. Let's use Ctrl Shift click once more, and let's preview this at this geometry here. And we don't see anything, but there is no need to be discouraged. We actually are only missing resolution. So if you turn this eye icon off here, and then you see we only have like four points. Well, this is no resolution here, right? So let's add more. Let's add a subdivision and let's add 10 and then again, 10 times. So we currently have a big number. I don't know exactly what number, but a big number of vertices. And now if you preview this again, well, we see an SDF for sure. Although this is a bit of a lopsided SDF since the actual surface seems to be here, but the monkey is well and visible here. And that's because of the object info node, which is actually driving in a monkey like that, like that, which is a bigger one than we had for it. So, and that's because we are using the original position, not the relative ones, which takes into account all of the movement and, and the rotations of this monkey. So this is how we generate an SDF of the monkey. It was pretty simple, right? We can also uh, visualize the ISO lines here. If you use the sign function, for example, and a multiplication and do like that. This is the sign distance field of the monkey calculated for each face. If the monkey has more resolution, for example, if you press control two, uh, then it gets, you know, smoothed out and the SDF is uh, dramatically 
smoother as you see. So let's drag in our cube now as well and let's see how this minimum uh, deal works. So let's make the cube and look a little bit smaller. Let's put it here. Let's drag in the cube and let's use uh, the same proximity like that. And I'm going to plug this here. And now before we do any ISO aligning and stuff, let's just use a min function. Where is the minimum? And plug it here. So now of course you see there is a certain problem. That's because you're not using the relative position. And as you see, the SDF of the cube is here and it is being mixed together with uh, the SDF of the monkey using the minimum function. And this of course leaves us with very sharp, sharp lines. So for example, I'm going to actually remove the ISO lines here and I'm just going to use a greater than. As you see, it doesn't look very, very smooth, right? So to smooth it out, let's switch the minimum to smooth minimum. And <laughs> I mean, it's smooth, right? You can just smooth it out as much as you want. And this looks, I would say, pretty, pretty nice. But this here doesn't help us with the topology. I mean, this just is a nice colorful example, but this actually doesn't create a new object that is, you know, morphed together. One of the problems is that, I mean, we have a widely different topology between those two objects. And the solution uh, to deal with this uh, topology is to use remeshing, since this just, you know, allows for putting together any sorts of objects that you have. So let's do this. For that, uh, how do we, what do we do if you want to remesh an object? We probably first convert this into a volume. We do a mesh to volume, and then we do a volume to mesh. And this one will look absolutely horrible. I will show you uh, how horrible exactly. Well, about that. And yeah, of course we can turn on the exterior and we can add some more resolution here. But still, it is a rather horrible result, very jagged and doesn't work nicely for us. So the mesh to volume goes to the trash can. We don't need this too much. We are actually building our own remeshing node for that. So let's use a volume cube and put this here. We immediately get a cube. Now uh, the volume cube is made out of voxels. So we currently have like 32 on one side and then 32 and then again 32, which means around 27,000 uh, in total. And this um, means that for each one of those, using this input, we can input the different uh, value of density. And this is very powerful because why not, you know, just put in a number here where we can put in the SDF of the monkey, right? Let's put it here. And look at that. Inside here we have a monkey. Although a bit of a sick one, but it, it's a monkey, right? Obviously inverted. We have a problem here. And uh, I mean, how can we solve this? Well, first you have to understand why this even happens before we start to solve anything. I mean, I think it's a good practice. So let's cut this thing into half uh, so that we can see what happens in the inside, like that. And you see here is this slice of the monkey. Uh, why does this happen? Well, if you look at Susan monkey, and I'm going to set the viewport display to wire. If you look at the Susan monkey, I'm going to make this a little bit larger. Um, then, uh, per each voxel, you're going to calculate the distance. So around here, distance is 0 0.1. And also in the inside, it's 0 0.1. Why it's 0 0.1? Well, because our threshold is 0 0.1. So values larger than this threshold are inside the generated mesh, which means that we get the mesh outside, of course. So now you might be thinking, all right, I'm going to take color ramp. I'm going to invert this. That's a nice idea. I tried it too. But what it does is that it actually, if you now increase the threshold a little bit, it brings you to something like that, which might be nice in some uh, occasions, but actually it's, you know, it's a shell and maybe a ghost inside, <laughs> but it's a shell. And we, for morphing and some more complex SDF work, we would prefer this to be filled. So the question is, how do we do this? Well, we can do this actually pretty interestingly. So as you understand, the values here are uh, increasing on the outside and also increasing to the inside. So if you would, uh, for example, let's put here, this one here is zero, this one is 0 0.1, and this one here is 0 0.3 and so on, and in the inside as well. So how could we do so that everything that is larger than 0 0.1 is inside of the monkey? So, because this is what we want to have. Well, for that, there is actually a pretty simple solution. We just are going to add negative signs before those things. So 
Now, I mean, if it tells us that, you know, values larger than this threshold are inside, well, of course, if you put this to 0 0.1, it will only keep this part because those have negative signs. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty wise solution, I think. So how do we do this? Well, what is common among all of those areas that have to have the negative sign? Well, they are outside of the monkey. So we have to find for every voxel. Is it outside? Is it inside? And we're going to make a decision based on that. This is actually pretty simple. I'm going to add a little uh, you know, visualizer for you. Distribute uh, points in volume. Disconnect this. Put this here. This looks like that. It's not very good. Let's use a grid distribution and maybe difference of 0 0.1. So these are our voxels. And this is a good visualizer. So how can we decide? Uh, how can we decide if something is outside from the surface of the monkey? Well, a solution I generally tend to use is that. So that, for example, let's pick this point right here. For that point, we are going to find the closest face. So we are going to do like that, like that. This one is the closest face to this point here. We are actually going to find the position of this closest face, which is around in the center. And of course, also the position of this uh, point that we are having under question. Then we are going to draw a vector from this point to around here. Uh, so we know in which direction it is. And then we are going to see, but what about the normal of this closest face? Where is it pointing? So this one is pointing in this direction. And then we can compare. All right, are the purple and green vectors, are they aligned? If they are not aligned, then the point is outside of the monkey. So for example, for this, this point right here, I mean, the vectors would be, well, much more aligned than for this point. So we know this one here is inside. So let's implement this system. And for that, well, we defined for each a voxel, the closest face on the surface of the monkey. So let's do this sample nearest, because nearest also means closest. So let's use the closest what? The closest face, nearest face. Now we get the index of the face. So this by itself doesn't give us too much. We have to use this in combination of something. Let's sample at that index something. Let's track this index here. We of course want to get values from the same geometry, of course. And let's sample at this index, uh, the position. So this would give us currently the position of the closest face, right? The position of this uh, cyan face right here. This one is coming out from here. Now we also need the position of the point itself, which we can just do like that. And I'm going to explain you why this works in a second. And well, then we just have to, you know, get the, get the, get the vector between those two um, outputs here. So uh, the formula for generating a vector based on two numbers like that is just subtract from the end the start. So the end, or where the arrow of this vector is, is the nearest face. So we know this one is the end, so let's use vector math. And subtract from the end, the start. This one is now our vector. So uh, this one would be called direction to closest face. This one also has to be set to face. Now we just need to get the normal at the same face. Well, for that, let's duplicate this one here, move it here, at the same index, from the same geometry, and at this index, we want to get the normal, preferably not a bad normal. <laughs> and now we want to compare if those two, if the normal and this vector are roughly aligned. So actually, how do those things look? Well, uh, let's look at that. This is the direction to the closest face. Looks like that. I mean, this looks like a mess, right? But actually, it makes sense because, you know, as you see up here, the Z gizmo here is blue. These ones here are also blue. And that's because here the monkey is up from them. So they have to travel like a direction upwards to get to the monkey. And for example, those here have to move uh, towards the Y. So they are green. So this tells us our system is working. The normal, you know, looks like that. For example, for this point here or voxel, we are finding the closest face somewhere on the surface here. And the surface is kind of looking upwards. So this is, why th this is why this is blue. And here they are negative because they're all the negative quadrant and so on. So this is how you can read the colors. Now let's, you know, just compare them. So for that, we have an operation called dot product like that. And we can put them together. And let's preview this. And look at that. We see the inside 
this monkey is lit up. So if you don't know what dot product does, it gives you the angle between two vectors. Um, and currently, I mean, for the inside points, right, to see the vectors, uh, like the position vector and the normal vector, they're kind of aligned. So let's say that this, they're perfectly aligned and their angle, therefore, is zero. And, I mean, the cosine of zero, I mean, zero, and let's use the cosine, it's one, right? So that's why you see they are having, like, you know, positive values here. And if they are, like, fully opposite, the result is minus one. However, we are having a little problem here. And that's because while the normal is always having a certain length, the direction to the closest face can be very, very long. Because, I mean, the distance, for example, from here to here is definitely longer than from here to there. So in order to get some like weird results, let's just use a normalize, which um, does what I just put on screen. And now we get some better results. So. We have uh, this system ready. We know whether or not something is inside uh, the ones that are white, but we actually want to get, you know, the outside. So for that, let's use a compare nodes and let's compare less than. And now they are, you know, the outside is white and it's looking all good. This is basically working. Now let's group this system that we have here. I'm going to select all of the nodes and control G like that. And this is now our uh, system. So I made the UI a little bit larger. So this is called outside and the input, let's call this as geo and let's call this outside. Catch me outside if you can. I believe this was a meme. Now we know the outside. And as you remember, what you have to do, or what you had to do is to just multiply the outside results of this SDF that is coming from here with minus one. The SDF currently looks like that, as you see. We have to make the outside multiplied with minus one, so this would probably turn black. So let's do this and let's use a mix node for that. And let's switch this to color. And you might be asking, why do we do this? The reason is that this one has a multiply and the float one, it doesn't. Would be good to have this, but we don't. So let's use a color multiply. And we're multiplying the SDF. We're multiplying this with minus one. And for that, let's just use a value node and put here minus one. Let's put this here. And where do we do this? Well, the factor would tell us, right? We're going to do this outside of the monkey. And now we have a correct SDF. This one really works, believe me. Uh, let's put this here like that. Let's put the result into the density and delete those points here. And let's see how this works. Seems to be working nice, right? But how do we move this one like outwards a little bit? Well, for that, let's use the math node. And let's just shift this field. So for example, if you were to add 0 0.1 to each value here, uh, then uh, this would, uh, the zero would move outwards, right? Therefore the mesh should, should move kind of here. So let's do this, 0 0.1. Let's see if it works. Exactly. I was pretty precise, nice. So uh, now this is working perfectly. It is giving us a correct tree mesh and we can, you know, increase or decrease this SDF by as much as we like to. It is a very correct and nice one for this volume cube purpose. Let's uh, group all of that, Control G, and let's call this correct SDF and input again a GO, and let's call this correct SDF as well. And maybe inside here, actually, we should add a threshold or like a boundary control. So let's have boundary control here and now this is how it looks. We have a boundary and we have an SDF. So you might be thinking, all right, but is it now time to morph those two objects together? It is. We have one last issue before we can do that. The issue is that the volume cube is, well, it's too large. And because uh, these volume operations are pretty expensive, it is nice to use the voxels we have to their fullest, which means we would, you know, kind of fit this to the monkey. For that, we only have we have one node in Blender as well. This is called bounds, bounding box. So let's get the bounds of the monkey and let's put those to the min and to the max of this thing. And well, this is this Suzanne is now precisely inside here, which is good. However, there is a problem with the resolution of this thing. I mean, let's say I'm going to scale my monkey like very much on the x-axis. Then you can see this gets a little bit like stretched here. And that's because uh, however large this is on different axes, we still have only 32 per each axis. Let's say if this is one meter long, we're going to have the resolution of one. 
If this one is like seven meters, we're gonna have seven and so on. So how do we do this? Well, as you know, um, if you know the min and max, I mean, the range, you probably know this is one, right? So what kind of an operation do you have to do to get this number? Well, you have to uh, do 0 0.5 minus minus 0 0.5. So the max minus the min. So let's use a subtract max minus min. So now we have here the range of on every axis because it's doing this on all the axes at the same time. And uh, now that we know this, we can just uh, separate this. We can separate the x, y, and z and put the x and y and z here. Doesn't seem to work too well. And that's true. And that's because it tells us the resolution must be greater than 1. Well, of course it has to be. So we just have to, you know, scale this, multiply with something. Scaling is just multiplying a vector. As you see, when we scale, the resolution increases and it's having all the same nice scale. I'm going to put 20 here. And I'm also going to like um, group this thing, maybe call this um, geo, min, max, x, y, z. This should actually be integers. I don't think it is actually going to help anything. And the scale as well should be an integer and maybe better called resolution. And it shouldn't be, you know, as smaller than two. Let's call this resolution. And this is now our workhorse doing everything we need. So I'm going to put the resolution to like, let's put it to 20 or 240 right now. And now let's connect the correct SDF here. And our monkey looks pretty, pretty nice, I would say. Now let's get to the exciting part. Let's do the morphing. What do we want to morph? A cube uh, with a monkey. Let's do this. So let's take in a cube. And of course, from this cube, we actually need the correct SDF as well. Let's drag the geometry here. And we also need to put the cube to the resolution. So let's use join geometry and where is this cube actually even so we're going to move this cube to around here and let's connect now the cubes sdf here so of course it's wrong it has to be relative i mean we have an error here and that's because i mean the ranges are like so precise like surgically precise that it can get some errors that happen here so for those ranges let's just add you know let's subtract like 0 0.01 for the min and let's add 0 0.01 to the max. So they're like a little bit larger than you have to be, but they're still in proportion. You know, as you see, the cube is getting, you know, pre-meshed and so is the monkey. The question is how to put them together with a math nose. So let's use a smooth minimum here. And actually it seems to be doing some, you know, weird things because our SDFs are not technically in the right like order it's like growing to the inside uh, instead of growing to the outside so we actually should use smooth maximum here and now watch that if we increase the distance we get a smooth weld between those two objects and we can move um, the cube around like that and it starts to you know and uh, and as you see it, you know, just creates this blend between these objects, which is so cool. Looks very nice. I think it's a really cool object. I actually have a tutorial on Blender. <laughs> I actually have a tutorial on Patreon, how you can just uh, get this weld between the objects. So you don't have to like remesh the pool object, which is like really useful in the cases where you don't want to actually morph, but just, you know, smoothly connect two objects. So you can check this out on Patreon. So this is good and all, but we are here to morph, right? So yeah, we can put this inside. We can make like a cubic monkey, but uh, how do we actually make those objects grow as you saw in the um, intro? Well, for that, I discovered a really interesting thing, which is um, of course also about the SDF of the object. Of the object. So um, I'm going to disconnect the cube for a moment and let's just use uh, the proximity. Uh, let's calculate like the SDF of the monkey again. So this node has a distance output, but it also has a position output. And this one is a pretty janky one. So we can use this in a really cool way. We can take this position. We can get the length of this position. And if you put this to the density, you will see some weird things happening. So for example, if you use like a, just a math node here and we add and subtract, you see something is happening here, right? It is a bit weird. But you know, it's growing like from the inside to the, from the outside to the inside. So let's just multiply this with minus one. And 
let's see how it works right now. So as you see, right, it starts to grow, does some weird things, but it fills up like this volume queue pretty quickly. So it doesn't look like very, very much like monkey anymore. To fix this, uh, don't uh, forget that we have here our correct SDF that has information about the outside of the monkey. And this is actually a negative. So we can just use a smooth minimum between those uh, two things like that. And well, this gives us the correct answer because it cuts away the outer part. So if we now do that, you see the mesh is growing in a very interesting and I would say organic way, but it might be a little bit too sharp, right? I mean, it doesn't look very good. So to make it really organic, we can just add some distance to the smooth mirror. And now it smooths it out and it looks, in my opinion, pretty good. So this one is like our growth SDF. So I'm going to select those nodes, press Ctrl G, group those and add a, you know, like a growth value here. The add nodes is called growth. And let's output this as growth SDF. And let's go out from here and let's call this as well growth. So now we have like the correct SDF. We have the growth. We can put those together with smooth maximum, smooth minimum. And then this one with smooth maximum, let's uh, connect the cube here, put it like that. And we have the cube uh, remeshed and this works exactly as it used to work. Everything is, you know, is the same. So I don't want to add the growth to the cube itself because it's kind of boring. I mean, I would much rather use something more interesting like this hand here, for example, I put the link in the description for that. And, uh, you know, make this, let's make this a little bit larger, uh, smaller, so that it's, you know, actually reasonable. And let's rotate this on the X axis. Let's put this inside of the monkey. And this is kind of a dense mesh. So this will take more time because you have to do all of those calculations per each face. So let's actually use um, the decimate modifier on this hand. And let's unsubdivide this like maybe five times. And now this looks you know, much, much better. It doesn't have all the detail, but we don't, we don't need this currently. We have the hand. Let's switch the cube for the hand. Let's see how this looks. Put this distance to zero right now. And let's put the hand also to the a resolution thing. And let's hide the hand, hide the Susan. Well, it doesn't look too convincing. And yeah, of course, mm, what we actually need is to also add the growth to the hand. So let's uh, duplicate the growth. And let's add the growth to the hand as well. And let's uh, join those two with a smooth minimum. Let's also see how a hand actually grows. Well, a hand grows pretty nicely, I would say. Like a hand pretty much grows in real life. So uh, now we can put those uh, together with smooth min and uh, or max. And, you know, add some welding between those. And our question is, but how can I get from one mesh to another? Well, the key here is to morph or grow at the same time, but in inverse directions. Let's do this. And um, I'm going to add a mix node. Uh, why am I doing this? Because I just like the slider here. And I'm going to slide between one, uh, zero and one. When this is at zero, uh, what objects do I want to have? I want to have the Susan. So when this is at zero, let's say the Susan growth, where does it have to be? Uh, it has to be fully grown. So something like that. Test bit 1.4. So I'm going to use map range. So when this one is at zero from minimum zero, this one has to be at 1.4. And when this one is at one, the Susan has to be disappeared. So I'm going to make the growth small just until it is gone. 0 0.3, 0 0.4 seems to work. Now I'm going to connect this one here and let's see if this one works now nicely. So yes, it has remapped the values. So at one, it has disappeared at zero. It is there. Now, uh, the inverse is true for the hand. So when this is at zero, I want to have the monkey, but no hand at all. So, um, this means I'm going to put the hand to zero by two, going to add the map range. And if you want to empty all the values, you can just press backspace. It will delete everything. So I'm going to drag here and when this is at zero, I want this to be at 0 0.1, right? Um, 0 
And when this is at one, I want to have a full grown hand, like a real, real massive hand here. So I'm going to increase this just until it has grown to 1.7 or something. Right, this is, this is good. And maybe I'm going to you know, make this map range smaller a little bit. You can get the project file on Patreon as well if you want to like dive a bit deeper into it. And let's let's now see how it looks right. And we do like that. I think it looks pretty good. I would say it looks pretty good. Yeah. In my opinion, a pretty successful morph, especially like this, like this uh, moment here. My other question probably is, well, but this looks kind of, you know, jack. It is true. So, for example, when you add more resolution, it also gets slower. But there might be some problems here, and that's because of the faces of the objects. Um, and, I mean, they don't have infinite resolution, like something mathematical, like the sphere. So they have, like, those dis discontinuities. So, uh, to get rid of this, well, there are no good ways, because we cannot um, blur the attribute here per each voxel. This is impossible. But what we can blur is uh, the position of the resulting vertices. So I'm going to put the set position here and I'm going to use a blur attribute and you need Blender 3.5 at least for that. So let's use position and vector and blur this. So what does blurring mean? It basically uses neighboring values, so basically like smears it around. So let's use maybe like five iterations. You can see what happens. Yeah, it turns. It, it becomes a lot more smooth, I see. It's up to you as much you want here. I think this looks much better than it, than it looked. Uh, the last thing you might uh, be needing is that, you know, you have currently actually two objects here. So let's say I have a material uh, and I'm going to turn down the resolution just a little bit. So let's say you have this material and we also need a uh, shade smooth. You have this material the third time and you want to differentiate between those two objects well currently you cannot because I mean change the color and well everything changes at the same time so we need to output some kind of a factor uh, per each object and for that actually what we can use is the SDF of the object itself so this one is for the Susan this one is for the hand so let's preview this and let's preview this at the resulting geometry. So this is like the factor of the Susan uh, dynamically adjusting itself. So for example, when I change this, you see turns into a Susan, turns into a hand, right? So uh, what we can do is we can store this as a named attribute. So let's see, store this at the point and it's a float attribute, just some grayscale values. Let's call this, for example, A, like because you maybe have different objects. And of course, the other attribute would be called a B because it's like second object. You can also have like three, two, I don't know, seven objects, but I mean, the more objects you have, more polygons, it's going to take more time to calculate. So you should just, you know, be wary of that. So now that we have those attributes, what we can do is we can go, we can go to shaders uh, like that. And we can use attribute here, and we can use the A attribute, for example, color. Look at that. It's, this is the, you know, the monkey. And if we, if we change anything here, the monkey gradually disappears. Now, of course, you see, well, doesn't this look a bit bad? It does. So we just blur these attributes. Well, of course, we can do that. So let's use a blur attribute again. Set this to float. And we're using the A attribute, right? So let's put the blur here. And oh my god, it starts to auto offset again. So let's blur this attribute. And now this is, you know, looking much better for material use, I believe. And I'm going to do the same for the B here as well. Uh, now we have those two attributes and you can use them for pretty much anything you want. So yeah, you can now, you know, mix between the two materials or change these inputs here. You can get some different things. So it's up to you. So if you want to put textures here, I have a tutorial on Patreon which shows you how you can use tree planner mapping to basically also move along with the object, with the drivers and so on. So if you're interested in that, uh, which you probably are, then you can go look at Patreon. This was the tutorial. I hope you enjoyed that. The next one is going to be about simulation nodes. So exciting, right? See you next time.